Hi, everyone. Welcome to Thriving in 2020 online series. Uh, this show is meant to help you, teach you, give you all the steps and strategies on how you can create more time, make more money, and get into your best shape ever this year in 2020. And today's episode, I interview a very amazing, amazing individual. Her name is Lisa Phillips. Lisa is a real estate investor who helps African American professionals build a profitable rental property portfolios. And she has such a huge heart to just help people create a thriving lifestyle where you have residual income coming in, cash flow coming in. And we talked about topics such as how money is a tool. It's not a master in our life that dictates everything that we do. And how even having this extra residual income, say of $2,000 can give us so much more room and space and mental clarity and just that room for us to create and to get to know who we are. It's really powerful stuff. Like she even gave us so many tons of strategies that we can implement right away if we want to get into real estate investing. And the catch is that anyone can start even without so much capital. Like one thing for me that I know uh, always hold me back from getting into real estate investing is like I thought that I need tons of capital to get started. But Lisa is going to break that myth down and show you how she was able to invest with not that much capital. So make sure you tune in to this interview and we'll see you on the inside. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much for being on this episode today. We were talking a little bit before we hit the record button and I'm just so excited for this interview because you're a lady boss in the real estate investing uh, space and you're so amazing at helping other people achieve like similar success as you and building the residual income cash flow. So I am ready to dive in and thank you so much again for being here and taking some time to talk to our audience. Thank you. Thank you to the audience and thank you for um, the invitation. I am honored and I love everything that you're about because at the end of the day, we need to make a commitment to be happy and honoring what we really want to do versus what we think we're forced to do is how we're going to get there. So yes. thank you for like being the spearhead of that. <laughs> awesome. So I want to get started first with your story and just to give our audience a little bit background in terms of who Lisa is, like how did she become this amazing, successful real oh. estate <laughs> <laughs> investor? So tell us, take us back in time, like what were you doing before all of this happened? So I'll start way back. I grew up lower income, working class neighborhood. Uh, both of my parents were blue collar. And uh, that sort of denoted everything. So I was poor but happy, right? And uh, that forms the basis of everything that I have built afterwards because I didn't have a negative connotation. I knew I wanted more money, but I didn't have like a negative connotation towards being uh, lower income or not having a ton of money because you have other things. Like you have big families. You have a lot of kids to play with. You have a little bit more freedom because your mom's working. Like there's other things that came with it. And that, that sort of did everything. So um, at that moment in time, I didn't really have an idea of entrepreneurship because everyone I knew who was an entrepreneur, I didn't know really successful ones, people who were thriving at their craft. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, the only thing that made logical sense at that time in that moment was getting the job, going to college. I got an electrical engineering degree. You know, I like the creativity aspect of it. I like the energy aspect of it. And just, I knew they were stable jobs, really. Like it was just really practical. So I went into it, but even before I graduated, I had three internships and I was like, no, I'm not like you guys. So <laughs> um, I gotta go, I got a little too much sparkle and shine that doesn't really fit into this. It can be a bit of a stead, um, same old traditional conservative environment. And I'm just not like that. As nice as the individual engineers who I met were. Um, so I went into, um, I got a job offer with IBM out of college and technical sales. I like the sales and helping and customer service aspect because I am a people person at my heart, regardless mm -hmm. of what systems I come into. And that led me through a whole series of jobs. And the job itself wasn't terrible, but it really was getting into corporate America. 
And a big realization was I am not fit for corporate America. <laughs> there are times when you need to keep your mouth shut in corporate America and politi I don't have the office politics savvy to A, want to do it, B, know to do it, or even have the willpower to attempt it. So it really just is obvious that my working class roots, just saying what was on my mind, speaking truth, even though it's not what people want to hear, is something that was a part of me fundamentally that I just refused to give up. So even though corporate America was paying the bills, it was like a constant struggle of not staying long, getting laid off, getting fired, quitting, all three in equal amounts. I just like this, and then the realization this isn't for me. It was the only path that I saw and knew was getting a degree and working for other people, but there comes that needs to be a point, a come to Jesus moment where you're like, girl, you just don't fit in and you're <laughs> not going to fit in because you don't want to change and they want you to change. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So you need to like, like honor that, like come to Jesus, right? Like do what you need to do. And so I had been, um, so that was, so I had been out of college from in 2006 and <laughs> um at 24 so it was about five years of that mm -hmm. and so maybe around the age of 29 um in 2000 um like 10 2011 that i was like i need another way mm -hmm. and i looked at real estate investing i had enough money coming in i was single so i had a bit of savings maybe like 10 15 000. not extreme but there are people who have that much save right mm -hmm. um that's not an impossibility and I really started looking at real estate investing and um, I saw a lot of cheap houses and I'm like, why is everyone ignoring them? But you also need to understand. So my platform is based, I do mostly focus on helping black professionals and Hispanic professionals invest in real estate investing because those were the ones who heard what I was saying and responded. And I actually got a lot of pushback. Um, I call my investing strategy sub 30 K. There were literally people in the establishment who would look at that and go, don't buy a sub 30K pig. Don't do this. Oh, I mean, and they were slapping it down. <laughs> so let's go into the background of this, right? So the traditional person who was giving the majority of advice throughout the aughts and throughout, you know, the teens, 2010s, when I was looking, were mostly white males who were affluent. So their path to real estate investing was, ask your parents for a loan. Ask your friends to raise $500,000. And for them, that is real advice, okay? Uh, because of the generational wealth they were able to inherit, that's what they had. But a lot of people out there do not have generational health, especially in the black community. In many parts, it was stripped for them, eminent domain taken from them, riots, you name it, redlining. Uh, <laughs> I can go on things that happened in the past that are still going on today. Uh, can't get a home loan. Every single bank has been fined because even if you have two people um, of the same exact credit profile making the same exact amount, a black person is less likely to get that loan than a white person. That, that is reality. Those are facts. And so when you have this um, conversation about real estate investing and you have one majority saying this is how you do it, but it relied on generational wealth or, oh, you know, someone in your community says they don't have money. You know, they're just saying that they do just get them by themselves. Like, no, in my community, they don't have money. <laughs> like, not like that. Right. So, I mean, there's so many things that go into this on why there's an inequality in the advice because you're talking to two different people and the people who are giving the advice wasn't necessarily wrong. They were just not being very upfront about who their advice was for. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, they just had no clue that they had a lot of assumptions when they were talking to people that what is actual for them is actual for everyone. And it's right. not just at black people and Hispanic who understand and picked up what I was saying. There's a lot of first, um, there are a lot of, uh, what is it? First generation mm -hmm. immigrants from mm -hmm. Korea, China, who are in my Facebook group who are mm -hmm. like, girl, I don't have any generational wealth either. So I got you right. Like it's not just, they're the ones who really picked it up and related to it, but there's, mm -hmm. it is a big umbrella on people who did not grow up in that class where you can raise that sort of money and you have that sort of friends where that traditional advice for syndication fundraising was a reality, right? So they were mm -hmm. talking amongst themselves, but they were talking to us as if we were included, but they either did not know or were not aware that their advice was really just for themselves or people with their pocketbooks or yeah. their background. And so all of that shapes everything 
because when I started um, in, you know, when I was 29 around that time and I'd been five years in corporate America, I was like, I need passive income. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't keep getting fired. I don't like these jobs. I don't like how I have to code switch. I don't want to pretend. A lot of you guys do it. Cool. That's you. I just made a commitment to be me. And then that commitment to be me that I made a long time ago, I was like, I'm just not going to keep my mouth shut. I'm going to speak mm -hmm. on things. I'm going to ask why things are like that. Um, I'm not going to play office politics. And that, you know what? You don't play. You, you, it doesn't work long term. So I was like, I need to do real estate investing. But everyone's saying, you know, I was like, what about these cheap houses? And, you know, the gurus and the people in that subclass were just like, oh my gosh, never. And in my heart's of heart, knowing my background and how I grew up, I just knew they didn't know what they were like. They knew what they were talking about, but I knew that they were probably just like people stereotyped my poor community. Mm -hmm. I knew they were stereotyping these others. Cause I'm gonna tell you one thing, like no one ever had a bike stolen in my neighborhood, but I was that poor neighborhood. We were black, white, Hispanic, right? Mm -hmm. um, mostly it, I mean, I'm from Las Vegas, which is a Southwest. So it was Mexican. It wasn't like Guatemala. No, that's, that was a little later, but it was mostly Mexican, white, and black. Like, that's what it was. And, um, you know, so I knew that there was a stereotype about my community, but I also knew it was, like, the safest place you could ever grow up. Like, you grew up with tons of kids. The big kids automatically take care of the little kids. Mm -hmm. If you do anything wrong, someone's going to either grab you and spank you or tell your mom. <laughs> like, you really grew up in a community where people watched out for each other. So I knew that they stereotyped the place that I lived in, but I knew the reality was I was happy. We had fun, probably way more. That's why those kids in the suburbs are doing all sorts of crazy stuff. They just didn't have the freedom we did. I swear to God, like we were wilding out, but in a safe way, like you just took care <laughs> of each other. So, um, so I was like, you guys are overlooking a lot of neighborhoods, not every neighborhood that is low income is crime ridden, crime infested and drug infested. Like that's not not every neighborhood. And so when I saw these 13, 20, 25, $30,000 houses, I was like, well, okay, you guys are saying all these things are wrong. So let me add that, include that in my system. So let me check the crime resource. Let me, let me check the neighborhood. Let me check and see what it looks like. And when you did it, you saw that, yes, a lot of what they were talking about was based in lack of knowledge and fear. Mm -hmm and people who were unsuccessful. But mind you, it makes sense they may have been unsuccessful because if you come from a different culture and class, both, both things, and you don't know how to circumnavigate and scale up and down, you're <laughs> probably gonna do things that great on your tenant's nerves that you didn't, weren't even aware of. But you know, because you didn't take the time to understand that demographic, you probably just stepped all over customs and protocols and didn't even know, but then blame them for like, <laughs> it not going well without taking any ownership of maybe did you scale up or down to approach them in a way that they felt comfortable and secure in. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of different things. So money is one of these subjects. Real estate is one of these subjects. All of these are going to play a role into it. And I just found they weren't talking about any of these factors. Yeah, Lisa. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for that great intro telling me telling us about your Girl. story <laughs> so, we're all like, being I, truthful today so yeah, your, I, your audience can't handle it you know they can click off but you get the truth today no i just love so much of what you're doing because i resonate with exactly what you're talking about because like you know growing up all i saw was one path to generating success like financial abundance was just working for someone else but mm -hmm. when like i always knew real estate and investing things like that existed out there but I never knew how to do it and it always felt like this impossible kind of thing because I need a lot of money to invest so mm -hmm. you showing people that it's possible to invest with not that much capital like it just opens so many doors for people so like I, I am so excited for the work that you're doing for people but I want to ask you this though you know when you first started you probably were one of the first few like African American woman in the space and like really doing something completely different outside the box. So like, mm -hmm. how did you navigate? How did you learn the things that you needed to learn? Like, what did yeah. you lean on that, you know, when things get difficult? Like, how did you keep going? Yeah. So I wasn't the 
first uh, in the space because after I started, I started looking up books about investing in lower income neighborhoods and there were other um, authors who were black who mm -hmm. had written about it and have been successful. Okay. Um, just at that time, I took my stuff to YouTube. I took my stuff to Bigger Pockets and REI mm -hmm. Club. So just mm -hmm. at the right time, I spoke at it online versus just in a book. But there were others who were doing really well before me. It's just sometimes before the online space when you wrote a book, your book might be hot for a year, but if there's not that constant attention to it, like it's yeah. still there, but it's not in circulation, like some mm -hmm. of the great. So I think that's just what happened versus me going on YouTube in 2013 was just, it was just like that time people were figuring out YouTube a little bit more than they had before, right? Yeah. So it was just like timing. Um, and two, how did I get through it? You know? It really, sometimes it, I will say I will be, I was unique in a couple of ways in how I responded. Uh, I had this idea and confidence in my mind that like, even if things went bad, I could wait it out. I can save money and let time work for me. When I save the money, I could pay for it. So there is this just perception that like eventually this will get done. So things did come up. Like my first renovation I worked on it like, gosh, a month of Saturdays, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was just like three months of Saturdays. So it took like 11 months because I'd work on it like three to four Saturdays of every, uh -huh. you know, and, but the thing is, I was like, well, that just helps me each month. I save a thousand dollars or 1500 or 2000 and then I can pay for the next round of repairs. So there was just this level of like, because I was young, I felt, you know, I'm 29, 30. If it takes a year, it takes a year. I'm still doing better than like half of America. So there was this level of like, I'm still doing good because I started young and I was okay with letting time work for me. So it was a level of being able to see that time in the horizon and being okay with that. And I was okay with it because I didn't come from money. So time is your friend when you don't have a ton of money up front, but over time you can pay for anything. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So mm -hmm. it was sort of like being youthful, being sure that I can always get a job, because at that time I did have an electrical engineer degree. I had some technical skills. So I, you know, I chose that very practically. I didn't follow my heart at that time. Um, but you know, practicality does work. So I, you know, it was relatively easy if I got laid off to get another job, if I quit to get another job. Usually when I quit, I already had another job lined up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, there's a whole bunch of people I need to like charm in an interview until I can get in because I need to eat. Right. So, so it was, it was sort of like being okay with time. I'm young. Let this take a year. I'm young. Let it take five years. So, and I got that from my mom. I swear to God I did. She was, she had seven kids. She went back to school and I just grew up with this, like you work, you know, my dad woke up four o'clock, three o'clock every morning, my entire life. Okay. That is a example of hard work. It's an example of you do what you need to do. My mom had seven kids and she went back to school. She, we would have stories. She would tell me how she was trying to get her degree. She had to take organic chemistry, which is really difficult, mm -hmm. let alone difficult for a <laughs> woman with seven kids from yeah. a low income background. Okay. She took that class four times, wow. but my model growing up was if you need to take a class four times and get a C, mm -hmm. you're going to take it four times. If she needed to take it a fifth time, and this is like a semester, right? Mm -hmm. If she needed to take it a fifth time. So I did, you know, I'm very blessed to have a model of hard work, which when I do this thing, I approach it with that seam. I already have that in my soul, but like yeah. seeing that, well, if you just have to take five years, you just take five years. Mm -hmm. So there's this level of just being able to plow like a farmer and plant seeds until it actually happens. Um, in a way that I don't know if everyone has, has that modeled. So don't always have that within them so much. You definitely have those stories. And I read these inspirational stories of people like Tyler Perry. They're like, I slept in the car cause I knew it was, I knew this was what I needed to do. Right. Um, so definitely some people do have that drive to do this no matter what, but sometimes when you're not on the extreme end, you don't always see it. And so I'm grateful for that. And so those are one of the things that made it so I could handle the downs because mm -hmm. the downs for me was a part of life you just work mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. so but how do like anyone just get started though like do you learn on youtube yeah or, oh, it's like how did you get started <laughs> okay girl power 
Let's start with this. So when I had bought my first condo, it was 35,000 and I had just got, I bought it and then like two weeks later I got fired. But because it was a $35,000 condo, the mortgage was like $350 a month. Mm-hmm. I had a little money saved up to do some renovations. And mm-hmm. I remember I was like, yeah, I got to do all this work, but I just got fired. And my friend at the time was another lady. So she was like, a, she works, but she was very like empowered. And she said this one thing to me. So never underestimate the power. She just looked at me and she just said, why don't you just do it yourself? I put down this vinyl flooring and it was so funny because I'm so strong, but I never thought that I could do it myself. Sometimes you need people to look at you and just go, what? what's your problem? And you're like, yeah, I, I guess. Because it was this intimidating thing that only the men did. Mm. Does that make sense? So mm-hmm. ladies, don't, don't, don't hesitate to look at someone and just ask them why they aren't doing it themselves. Because sometimes that one question literally sparked all of this. Yeah. And so um, at that time, YouTube, and there was different online sources. So if I needed help with something, Home Depot had this, how to lay laminate flooring. You're like, okay, and you watch it, and you're like, let me try this, let me put the underlayment. Wait, well, Lisa, you did the renovation by yourself? <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. And that, that was me. Impressive. That was like Lisa back in the day. Now Lisa pays people to uh-huh. get it done so I can make money, right? But right, before right. I went through it to save money. Wow. But as you make more money, then you could start paying other people. There should be an evolution. <laughs> in mm-hmm. everyone's game right so yeah, before yeah. i did it and it was like home depot and that but what i would say now knowing what i do now and i've helped hundreds of people um mm-hmm. personally one-on-one i would say if you want to make this easy and <laughs> not learn from other people's mistake find someone in the niche you're looking to get into mm-hmm. if you're looking at getting to um flipping follow the flipper read what he has to say um, watch the videos because some people like me, I'm oral. I don't, I don't, I read, but mm-hmm. if I prefer to speak, have someone speak about their experiences. Yes. So I'm a YouTuber before I'm a booker, right? I'll read mm-hmm. your book after I watch your YouTube videos. And that's once I've gotten a feel for like your real authentic story mm-hmm. and whatnot. Other people like my ex-husband, he's a reader, right? Mm-hmm. So whatever medium you learn best in, learn through that medium Follow someone in that niche. And I say this niche because if you're looking to get just into rental properties, I'm in rental properties that are in the lower price range. We approach the metrics different. We look at different metrics. Over here, you look at what the quality of schools are. If you're looking at a mm-hmm. higher end rental. Me, I don't care about that. I'm looking at the crime. It is a different complex. So you have to approach them with different metrics on what mm-hmm. really matters to be successful. So find what you want to do. If you have a ton of money in the bank, do your high end thing, right? Mm -hmm. If you got like 15, $20,000, do my low end thing. Okay. So find someone that resonates with you two out there. If you're into flipping, if you're into this, there are millions of people who are walking through their experiences. I would say definitely listen to those stories. Does that Mm -hmm. method make sense for a, your idea of what you want your investment to look like and b your pocketbook. Mm -hmm. Both need to be in alignment. And at this day and age, there's nothing out there that someone hasn't orally orally and verbally done a video on. So definitely follow that advice because there's no reason for you to be making some easy mistakes that can be avoided if you would have read a book, right? Mm -hmm. Like one book, not not even like 20 books, just one. You don't even need, like read my book, okay? People are doing just fine reading my book. You don't believe me? Look at the Amazon reviews, all right? They're like, girl, you saved me money. So- (laughs) You don't even need to read a ton. You just need to read a book for that market because what I find is that if you just take all these sources, well, if you're talking about what goes on in Baltimore is not the same as what goes on in Indiana. Mm -hmm. The Midwest and Baltimore are different. Mm -hmm. One, it can be more urban. One can be uh, rural for that same $30,000 price, right? So just really start understanding that there's a difference and make sure that when you're asking questions, you're like being tailored. So don't just ask, what about this 30k property x like where is it at what location what's the demographic like really start learning how to that location 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 isn't trite it means Mm -hmm. something and at the end of the day i'm gonna be very honest i have people of all colors but mostly um it's black professionals and hispanic who work with me but i have people who are not black and hispanic right and Mm -hmm. you know the neighborhoods that they are comfortable in are different than the neighborhood i am comfortable in so sometimes the conversation is 
look, I know it's cheaper up here in Baltimore. Are you okay or comfortable in that very, you know, minority filled environment? Because if Mm -hmm. you're not, that is going to play a role. So if you need to up your price range to 60 or 70,000, but um, I had a one lady, she was, um, she was more comfortable in the 60 to 80,000 range in a Polish working class neighborhood, because mm-hmm. that is the neighborhood she grew up in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah, yeah, her eyeballs will go towards a low $30,000 eyeballs in this city in Pennsylvania. But I was like, if you're not comfortable there, mm-hmm. you're not comfortable. Mm-hmm. And this should be something you're proud to show people. And you, it can't always, it is about money, but it's not all about money. Money is a tool. It's not my master, right? So I love Mm -hmm. money as a tool, but don't let those low price balls put you in a situation. This one guy was talking about wearing a bulletproof vest to go visit his property. Like, what are you doing? Buy another, (laughs) buy another area. If I have to go anywhere where I feel the need to buy bulletproof (laughs) vests. I don't need to be investing there, right? Like you're letting yeah. money dictate against your, your, your comfortability. You're mm-hmm. letting money, money add more stress. And mm-hmm. this money should not be in your life to add more stress. It's to ease your stress. And that starts with the decisions you make. So part of what I also talk about is let's be real with who you really are. And if you're not comfortable in these neighborhoods, that's okay. Let's raise our price because let's, at the end of the day, you don't want to go to a neighborhood you're uncomfortable in because then your tenants are going to be uncomfortable. If you're not the same race, they're going to assume it's because of race. It may be low key. It is. You just don't realize it, mm-hmm. but whatever, they're going to assume that and act accordingly. Okay. Yeah. Whereas if you go down there and you're perfectly comfortable, people can feel, even if they can't, they don't know what's in your, 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 your mind, mm-hmm. but they can read your energy. Mm-hmm. They can yeah. tell that like, I talk maybe a little different, a little bit more proper than they do in their neighborhood but they can also tell that I'm looking them straight in the eye. They can also tell that I'm genuinely listening to them. They can also tell that like, I'm not scared to be here. They can Mm -hmm. tell that I'm comfortable around them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't know what's in your mind, but like they can read your energy. So if you're not comfortable there, either learn how to become comfortable. I think it's always a benefit for you to learn how to talk to all sorts of different people um, from homeless to millionaires. I think that's Mm -hmm. probably a, a benefit in today's society than not. So learning how to be comfortable with different demographics or me, can I go into Chinatown and be comfortable, right? I don't know the language, everyone's up. Am I comfortable there? Can I be comfortable there, right? Like, can I learn to be comfortable there if I'm not at first? Cause at first I felt like an outsider. Can I learn how to navigate it? It's always a good, a beneficial quality. Can I go to that Hispanic neighborhood where everyone speaks Spanish and be comfortable in that neighborhood? You know, yeah. like, that's a question for you to say. But um, also, though, when you, <laughs> there are also some really good real estate deals there, too. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, learning but how to the- be comfortable with people is a social skill that can also yeah. be a financial skill. But yeah. if, if you're not, then follow that. Don't just chase, don't just chase waterfalls over the edge, right? Like, mm-hmm. money's not my master, but it is a tool. I'm going to keep saying that because it's real. Yeah, my I have a business coach, Shanda. She always say that connection is currency. It's all about mm-hmm. connection. So, mm-hmm. but I, I just love so much about what you mentioned about how even though real estate investing, like you're trying to build wealth, but it's not about the money. Like mm-hmm. you're not trying to find yourself another job where nope. your your future, your life is dictated by money and i love that so much i never looked at real estate investing that way so let me ask you this question just uh, we are getting to the end of this interview uh so just wrapping it up (laughs) um so i want to ask you though what is like the biggest difference or the reward for you in life now that you make this decision to become an entrepreneur build your own business as opposed to a corporate american job (laughs) Because I went into this because I knew I couldn't do corporate and I was like, let me get this passive income and it worked. Yeah. So many things came out of it because, because um, I actually wasn't doing this full time, but then I got laid off for like the third time from like the same company. And I had about 2000 in cash flow coming in from my three mm-hmm. properties at that time. Yeah. I was in 2015. And because I had $2,000 in cash flow, I didn't run out to get another corporate job. Mm-hmm. So this wasn't replacing my salary at the time when I got laid off, I was making six figures, right? Mm-hmm. So it wasn't replacing that, but it was enough where I could go. 
I have the freedom to look and see if I can build this platform of teaching others because it's working. I love what I'm doing. I'm getting validation. I'm validating others that I'm really helping them. But because I had that cash flow come in, I had the freedom to try a dream. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. Try to build something. And so the biggest thing that passive income gives me because I'm not creating another job, I'm creating a source of income. And it's like that's that, that difference we were talking about. It's not about money at the expense of everything, but money as a convenient tool to use to supplement. I was able to build another platform because I had a little money coming in that I could live off of. But also just, I had time to really focus on myself. Mm -hmm. I had time to get deeper into what my purpose is, my spiritual purpose and path, my gifts. I had time in my head to meditate more. Yeah. I had time to delve into maybe the esoteric things I wasn't looking into, like my birth chart, my numerology and all of this. And what does this mean <laughs> of who I am on a spirit? Spirituality, guess what? I'm a healer. I found out I'm a healer, right? <laughs> like I'm a spiritual yeah. healer. Like I channel angels, like I... I can heal myself. I heal my family. All of that came because I got breathing room mm -hmm. from the passive income. Mm -hmm. I built wealth because I sold one of the properties that I paid 34,000 for. I sold for 55. All of mm -hmm. a sudden in my bank account, I had a bigger exchange of cash I never had before. Mm -hmm. Right. So all of this was just like a great path, not only to inspire, I've inspired others who thought they couldn't do it. You know how big a deal that is because at my heart, I believe when we're all financially taken care of, this world's a better place. Yes. And that's where I focus. Mm -hmm. And so, you know how much difference, like me going forth in this, making in other people's life who didn't think they can do it, they have done it. They're on the other side and they're living a life they never thought they would live earlier and mm -hmm. faster because mm -hmm. I took the chance to put it out on YouTube and go, let me go full, full ham on this. So just on so many ways, I got in touch with like what my spiritual path and purpose is, inspire yeah. people because what your corporate job is may or may not be what your path is. But when you have money coming in and you, maybe you get fired or you leave, you have that opportunity to examine who you are and what you're really here to do. But you have a little bit of money coming in to supplement those choices. So I tell mm -hmm. everyone, if you read my book, if you go to my blog, What's your higher purpose? Like, what do you want to do afterwards? Okay, say you get the money, then what? Right? And 90, 80% are spiritually on point. They're like, you know what? I always wanted to help single mothers transition yeah. to the workspace and I want to do a nonprofit. Someone's like, I want to help felons who are in jail transition into entrepreneurship so that they have a chance. I want to help ex do this. I want to go to active Pakistan and kids don't have food, kids don't have clothes. They don't have shoes and food to eat. I want to help them every year, right? Yeah. I want to go back to my home country in Ghana and be a nurse for the people who can't afford it. Like the spiritual aspect of what like they really want to do, which is always helping and bringing other people up, really comes forward. And mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I don't care what everyone else talks about, but if you come to me and we talk about it, we're going to talk about what that higher purpose is. We're not a slave to money. Money is just a tool so we can do the work we're here to do. And let me tell you something. If everyone had the freedom to do what they're here to do from the gospel to helping mothers, to helping kids in Pakistan, to Ghana, like all of it, we don't need the government. We have each yeah. other. So what I help people do is just break free. You don't need a lot. $2,000 a month. I, I was making six figures. Mm -hmm. 2000 was not replacing my salary, but it's enough two, three years into investing mm -hmm. where you can take the time to figure out what you really want in that sort of like the bigger picture of what we're doing here and what I'm doing here and what I really hammer in, in addition to the wealth building. Like it's, it's a, it's a symbiotic, it, it, it hits on multiple levels. Lisa, you are just dropping fire nuggets <laughs> right now. <laughs> and yeah, you got me authentically. <laughs> yeah, you are speaking my language 100%. Like money is just gives us uh, more options in life and it opens up space for us to get to know who we are and we're not on that constant struggle where we're just barely making ends meet so I, I love that so much uh so Lisa to wrap up this interview uh, I would love our listeners to connect with you I bet they have so many more questions they want to continue to just pick your brain uh, maybe eventually even also learn from you learn how to invest so how can our listeners find you online and also I know you have prepared something very special for our listeners so if you want to talk on that as well yes so for the listeners 
listeners have a free training bundle. It talks about getting started for the initial amounts of money you want, to, like 10 to 15,000, right? That's the goal. Um, some of you in the audience are there already. You're like, I got more than that. Okay, great. You're ready. Other people you might have five, but just on how to get there. And um, it sort of goes into that beginning. If you want to do this, like this is what we're starting to look for. So a free training bundle um, to help you guys if you want to get started and get a nice little getting started overview on what you need to start this. Um, and um, that's the free training bundle for, the, for, for everyone here. Also, in addition, um, I do have a um, triple best-selling book. It has been since um, August 2018. I'm on three bestsellers on Amazon, women in business, um, real estate investing, and uh, buying and selling homes. I've been in the top like 11 ever since then. I think I checked real estate investing. I was number four this week. So my, wow. this space, apparently, <laughs> people look at this space on, my, on the picture of the book and they go, okay, maybe she's talking about something different. I am. But it's nice that people um, resonate to the image of me smiling and subconsciously going, well, let me see what she's talking about. Maybe it's something different because it is. Mm -hmm. And I don't gel with everyone, but I would prefer everyone at least hear my version of things before taking everyone else's advice because you might be really surprised at what you're being fed and what the reality is and how you can do it. So that's investing in rental properties for beginners. Mm -hmm. uh, I am currently making an audio book. I hope to have finished within the next seven days. I'm going through the third nice. round of edits. Uh, so it doesn't sound a hot mess because I have a very discerning audience. And mm -hmm. if I mess up on something, they're going to be like, hmm, it's a mess <laughs> paragraph. I heard her slur her words. So I know. So I'm on the third round of edits with that. And I'm launching a Spanish version because I know there's a lot of Spanish speakers who are, it's your first language. That's mm -hmm. going to be launched in the next week. It has been proofread and copyrighted, but that's like $5 on Kindle on Amazon or 15 for the paperback, or you can even go to my website and get a free copy, just pay shipping and handling. So it just depends. Um, or you can catch me on YouTube. Um, on YouTube, it's affordable REI, or you can just put Lisa Phillips real estate investing. I'll pop right mm -hmm. up. Um, so you do the free route on YouTube or the free gifts and training, um, do the book route, which I, I do highly recommend because a lot of my YouTube stuff is general mm -hmm. and high level. It's still good for setting the foundation it's foundational, I guess you would say. But the book, I actually did a lot of what I do in my training, a lot of what I do with my clients, and a lot of that back-end knowledge that you don't see unless you're in my group coaching program. Not all of it, but a good significant portion and those details are in the book. So that's mm -hmm. also a good way to do. And if you need the audio book, that'll be coming in the next week or so. That is so powerful, Lisa. You are so generous with the free content that you give out. And for anyone listening right now, like, there we go. We have everything that you need to get started if you want to get into real estate investing. Learn from people like Lisa who has done it before. There is no excuses. Just go do it. And I'll include all the links and resources added to Lisa's books and YouTube channel and everything inside the same email that this interview went out to so make sure you go back and check that uh, and also let us know what's your biggest takeaway from this interview but before we we end this interview I just want to say Lisa I acknowledge you so much for the amazing work that you're doing for, for so many people out there for people like me for mm -hmm. people listening uh, and I it's my wish and desire for our listener listeners to also know like there is a unique gift inside each of you you just have to step up to that and unleash that because there are people out there waiting to listen to what you have to offer uh the gifts that you have to bring so <laughs> yes <laughs> every single one of you guys let your light shine mm -hmm. and listen unapologetically i'm sort of surprised the more that i'm honest about stuff the more people like it i'm like oh i can talk about this all right let's go <laughs> so there's something inside you that you want to talk about but no one else is talking about but that's the yeah. stuff we need to hear yeah, exactly. So thank you again, Lisa. And I cannot wait to stay connected with you after this, even after the summit and continue to, you know, help you join forces to lift yeah. this human, human consciousness up. <laughs> we are doing our work. We're definitely yes. doing it. Thank you, Miko. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you all the listeners for tuning in. I'll see you next time.